If you have seen my character analysis of Crowfeather, then you are probably aware of my attitude toward his character and his immediate WindClan family. They're all bitches. If you haven't seen it, then I highly recommend you check that one out first, because what I'm about to say will carry so much more weight once you do. Now that this book is out, I just know I'm going to get a bunch of comments on that video saying, Duh, in Crowfeather's trial, they explain every- Yeah, well, that video was made long before this super edition came out, so shut your damn gobs. From the moment this book was announced, it faced heavy tides of skepticism from the fanbase. Knowing the events of the book start right after the great battle in The Last Hope, and that Breezepel is still a WindClan member in the present A Vision of Shadows, it doesn't take a large leap in logic to see that this book is going to deal with Crowfeather's unresolved issues, when a majority of the fans have taken a severe dislike toward his character. And inevitably, Breeze Pelt's redemption, when a lot of fans feel that he has no business being anything but the edgy, self-absorbed emo villain he once was. And I too felt the same way about these characters. I hated them to the core. It went so far as to declare Breeze Pelt's re-acceptance into WindClan as non-canon. I expected nothing but the worst out of this novel. I was fully prepared to dismiss it as another recent garbage fire, along with A Vision of Shadows and the most recent Super Editions. But when I stumbled upon a preview online, I gave it a try out of sheer curiosity, and I was pleasantly surprised. In just 15 pages, we get a deep, insightful look into Crowfeather's personality. From a prologue that gives us his perspective of Feathertail's death and his breakup with Leafpool, which served as the final straw that led Crowfeather to denounce love forever, believing it to only led to pain and loss. So I decided to check it out, and since I live in a small town, where the bookstore has a more relaxed attitude towards release dates and shelving, I was able to get my hands on it early. I read it in two days, and I have to say, it's good. It's actually good. Right from the start, you can tell the authors took people's criticisms of Breeze Pelt's redemption to heart because the fans' attitudes were reflected in the Wind Clan cats during the majority of the plot. Gorstail, a Wind Clan she cat, even wished death on Breeze Pelt in chapter one. And I have to admit, there was a time where I agreed with her. But thanks to this book, that time has passed. I can still hardly believe I'm saying this, but Crowfeather's trial earns every ounce of character development and emotion it strives to establish. It's truly ambitious in its goal to make Crowfeather, Nightcloud, and Breezepelt likable characters, and develop Heathertail and Breezepelt's romance. And astonishingly, it succeeds on every level. Even for people still unwilling to give these characters a chance, there's still something for everyone to enjoy, as Lionblaze and Jayfeather play an important role in the plot. Heathertail and Kestrel Flight enjoy plentiful moments of character development, and fan favorite Ivypool is treated to a few cameos. This is the book that fans truly deserve, a well-executed, mature story of love, redemption, and atonement. I highly recommend checking it out. So if you're interested at all, I urge you, stop the video now and come back once you've read it. It's spoiler territory from here on out. The book begins with WindClan honoring their fallen dead from the battle with the Dark Forest, and Crowfeather's commentary during the scene is instantly familiar to all who knew him from the previous books. His words, his thoughts, his actions are all in line with the Crowfeather we know. And for the first time ever, we finally get some insight into his deeper feelings and motivations. It's interesting to see him express not just disgust, but disappointment with Breeze Pelt, mixed with guilt for being a bad father. This one monologue sets the scene for most of Crowfeather's internal conflicts in this book, as he struggles to set things right with his family and comes to terms with his personal failings. This chapter also gives us a frame of reference for Crowfeather's growth, as he feels resentment that he was passed over as deputy, the position going instead to Hairspring, in a diplomatic move by One Star to show forgiveness towards the Dark Forest trainees. <sighs> oh god, One Star. 
Let's just say that he too is completely in character during this story and I don't know how he somehow manages to be even more of a pain in the ass than he was in A Vision of Shadows. But I'll get into that later. As I've mentioned before, Breezepel also starts off in a bad way, with most of his clanmates giving him the cold shoulder for fighting with the Dark Forest. Ashfoot, Crowfeather's mother, died in this battle, so it's easy to see that his resentment toward his son is intertwined with grief. I couldn't help but feel bad for Crowfeather during these moments, when he's almost overwhelmed with feelings of loss. Knowing how he quite literally denounced love altogether all those seasons ago. The one connection that he couldn't sever, the last familial tie to a positive relationship, gone in an instant. But, in a cruel twist of fate, or a harsh wave of karma, Breezepelt is thrust into the same misery as his father, when Nightcloud goes missing early on. You see, the threat the clans are facing today is an invasion of stoats also known as weasels, or ermines if you're a fancy-ass Canadian, that are residing in the tunnels in overwhelming numbers. Now, I can see some people complaining about this development, saying something along the lines of, oh come on, how could tiny little weasels pose a threat to cats? They're so tiny and cute in a way. And I'll have you know that a few disobedient Wind Clan apprentices who joined in on the battle they were forbidden from entering, thought the exact same thing. Moments before they got their asses handed to them. Just because ermines are small and cute, doesn't mean they're anything to sneeze at. They're the same size as a rat, with double the amount of flexibility and endurance, with bloody sharp claws and teeth to back it up. They've been known to kill animals ten times their own size. Just check out this clip if you don't believe me. An entire army of those suckers could easily pose a formidable threat to the clans. And that's exactly what they did. It all unfolds when One Star orders Crowfeather and some other cats to investigate the tunnels on their territory, as prey has been unusually scarce in that region lately. One of the apprentices, Hootpaw, claims to have seen a ghost cat going into the tunnels. And while Crowfeather shares his brief sighting, he is hesitant to believe that it was a ghost, as are the other Wind Clan cats when they find out. Oh, and on a side note, this quote sounds horrible out of context. Kestrel Flight also receives a vision of the tunnels flooding, and a gust of wind temporarily drives the water back, before it dies away and consumes the land. The characters spend a lot of time trying to interpret this vision, and it may just be me in my dense brain, but this time it was actually subtle enough to keep the readers guessing along with the cast throughout the book. As it turns out, it was actually clever foreshadowing to future events, but I'm getting off track. One Star decides to send another patrol to explore the tunnels and find out what's going on in there. But, like idiots, they decide to split off into pairs to explore the tunnels. Hairspring with Fur's Pelt, Crowfeather with Heathertail, and Breeze Pelt with Nightcloud. As you can expect from dumbass horror movie trope number 59, every pair gets attacked by a mob of stoats and is chased out of the tunnels, except Nightcloud. She provided cover for Breeze Pelt while he ran, and he was too terrified to notice that she wasn't behind him when he escaped. And this is the catalyst to the plot at hand. In the beginning, One Star tries to nudge Crowfeather toward making peace with his family. Both Nightcloud around, it's nearly impossible for him to do so. She's overprotective of Breeze Pelt, and since the two share a deep bond and a resentment towards Crowfeather, he was largely helpless to even approach them. Crowfeather states a few times that he always intended to make things right with his former mate, and even wanted to befriend her but he's always at a loss for words whenever he's around her, too uncomfortable to think of what to say. I can relate to that so much. Poor, socially inept Crowfeather. But with Nightcloud gone, Crowfeather is the only family Breezepel has left, and our protagonist spends a large portion of the book struggling with his burden. Although he holds a grudge against Breezepel for his actions, he still cares for him as a son but again, doesn't know how to express it. 
He's also thrust into the awkward position of defending Breeze Pelt from his clanmates, as many of them take any excuse they can to find him untrustworthy. And when I say excuses, bloody hell do I mean pathetic ass excuses. After a few unsuccessful search parties, Crowfeather tries to track Nightcloud's trail by himself. He follows her blood trail to a pond, where he finds an alarmingly large blood puddle, mingled with heavy fox scent. Since she was clearly injured, Crowfeather comes to the conclusion that she must have fallen prey to the foxes, and breaks the tragic news to WindClan. Breezepel does not take it that well. His gut reaction is to murder every single stoat in the tunnels, and proclaim that he doesn't care about anything else in the same moment. Leaftail, the second biggest douchebag in WindClan, takes this as proof of Breezepelt's disloyalty, and despite Crowfeather's explanation, almost every cat remains unsympathetic. Leaftail even says that he might deserve his suffering. Fucking wow! I never thought in a million years I would ever feel sorry for Breeze Pelt, but it turns out it's easy to make anyone sympathetic if you just make everyone around them even worse than they are. And this is just the beginning! When the clan holds vigil for Nightcloud, Breeze Pelt can't bring himself to attend, knowing his clan won't support him. It's sickening how right he turned out to be. <sighs> Crouchfoot accuses Breezepelt of leaving Nightcloud to die during the ceremony, with Leaftail piling on and implying that he may have even murdered her. Normally, it's pretty reasonable to suspect Breezepelt of murder, but this is Nightcloud we're talking about. The one cat who loved him unconditionally. The one he was always looking out for. It doesn't make any sense! So you can get a clear picture of just how much shit Breeze Pelt takes in this book. And while these callous Wind Clan asshats pissed me off a lot, I can recognize that this harshness was necessary. Breeze Pelt did a lot of terrible things, and seemingly didn't regret any of his crimes after it was all over. Under normal circumstances, Breezepel would have been treated with the same fate as every other warrior's villain with a similar track record. Murder or exile. Yet, for reasons beyond the reader's understanding, Breezepel got off scot-free. And it didn't go over so well. It's only natural that people reacted skeptically upon the announcement of a super edition that's half dedicated to this controversial character's redemption arc. The Aarons knew this had to be good. And they actually pulled it off! Breezepel is under the spotlight more than ever before, and instead of squandering their opportunity and keeping him as the same two-dimensional emo kid as always, they showed us what really makes him tick, revealed his true depths. That's more than I can say for SOME standalone Warriors books. Breezepel isn't just an asshole with daddy issues, he's an emotional wreck. It was never a mystery as to what Breezepelt inherited from his father, but it's never been more evident than in this novel. These Toms are the perfect foils to each other. Whereas Crowfeather bottles up all of his emotions and refuses to allow anyone to see past his stoic facade, Breezepelt wears his heart on his… leg? And erupts into extreme fits of emotion when subjected to heavy stress pushing away anyone who may have been sympathetic in the process. They both suffer from the same illness, but display completely different symptoms. As you can imagine, it's incredibly awkward for these two types of characters to interact. Pretty much every conversation between Crowfeather and Breezepelt is cringy in the most perfect way. It's both sad and entertaining to watch these two try to reach out to one another. What unites them under the same banner is the disappearance of Nightcloud. Breezepelt is desperate to find his loving mother, and Crowfeather wants to make amends for treating her so badly during their time together. Oh yeah, that's another point to talk about. Nightcloud. Despite her being absent from most of the novel, she too gets her fair share of development. It turns out she has a bad case of Leopardfoot Syndrome. When Breezepelt was born, there were two other kits in the litter. 
One was stillborn, and the other died shortly after birth. That led her to be extremely protective of her only surviving kit, contributing to the rift in their family. In another interesting development, Crowfeather reminisces about Breeze Pelt's kithood, feeling deep affection for the innocent, playful kit he once was. He remembers curling around his nest all night when he was very sick. Crowfeather did care for his son all along, but his severely damaged relationship with Nightcloud, coupled with her overprotective tendencies, kept him from being there for Breeze Pelt. Eventually, the distance became too impassable for Crowfeather, and he didn't know how to close it again. This, in turn, allowed Nightcloud to enable Breeze Pelt into believing that his father hated him. This explains so much about their family dynamic. In the previous books, all of this bitterness seemed to derive mostly from Crowfeather's actions. And while that is still true, it's clear that Nightcloud does share a significant portion of the blame. If you remember the allegiances from A Vision of Shadows, then you are aware that Nightcloud is still listed under WindClan. While this could be attributed to forgetfulness or last-minute changes, this time, it's not an error. Nightcloud doesn't actually die in this book. Skipping past the process that will take too long to explain, Crowfeather finds out from a wandering loner that Nightcloud survived her injuries, and he encouraged her to go to the two-leg place by the lake for help. Crowfeather and Breeze Pelt, along with Heathertail, Hootpaw, and Gorsetail, sneak out of camp to find her, following her trail to a cabin, inhabited by a young couple and their kitty pet. Not just any kitty pet, a kitty pet Tom. And this is where things get really interesting. Upon seeing Nightcloud again, curled up with the kitty pet in his bed, Crowfeather is bombarded by feelings of confused jealousy. Although he was always fully aware that he never had any romantic inclinations toward her, the mixture of relief for finding her alive and the alarm of seeing her getting cozy with an outsider flips all of his senses upside down. During the escape, we see a softer side to Nightcloud's personality as she says goodbye to her new friend, named Pickle. <laughs> the sad part is, I'm certain there's some jerk out there who would name their cat after a processed vegetable. Pickle is understandably alarmed to see Nightcloud go as she did enter his life as a gravely injured feral cat. While Heathertail and Hoopaw try to distract the two legs, Pickle starts caterwauling to alert them to Nightcloud's escape, and the woman grabs her. While this fuels Crowfeather's jealous rage even further, Nightcloud still manages to slip away, and the party escapes. Once they return to camp, Crowfeather and Nightcloud eventually get the chance to talk. Nightcloud reveals that she didn't want to return to the clan at first, because she was treated so well at the cabin. No matter how hostile she acted, the two legs in Pickle always tried to make her happy, a kindness she was never shown in Wind Clan. It was at this moment that Nightcloud found her way into my heart. Her relationship with Pickle, the way she tolerates petting from the two legs, her general attitude? It reminds me a lot of my first cat. Mary Sparkles. It just goes to show, the sharpest barbs guard the most loving hearts. Crowfeather, still in emotional limbo and filled with shame for his behavior toward Nightcloud, asks if she wants to get back together. Surprisingly, Nightcloud says no, pointing out the fact that they probably never loved each other in the first place. What a breath of fresh air this scene was. When Ashfoot starts appearing in Crowfeather's dreams and tells him to love, I was worried they were going to shoehorn in a rekindled romance between him and Nightcloud, despite the fact that they have such horrible history and zero chemistry. It wouldn't make any sense. Instead, we get a mature subplot of reconciling the past without digging it up. Learning to identify the fault lines in your broken relationships and forgiving the disasters before building a new one. And just like the dynamic between Crowfeather and Breezepelt, the newfound friendship between our main character and Nightcloud feels natural. Many of their conversations revolve around Breezepelt's budding romance with Heathertail. And it's just so adorable the way Nightcloud chastises Crowfeather for not noticing how obvious they are. We desperately need more of this in the future. 
If they made a whole book about Nightcloud being a sassy grandmother, I would buy it. And yeah, that's another issue we need to discuss, isn't it? The Breeze Pelt and Heathertail romance. This too was another development that left a sour taste in my mouth when it first came to light. But now it makes a lot of sense. If you pay attention to the details in Power of Three, there are hints that Breeze Pelt has a crush on Heathertail. And now in this novel, Crowfeather confirms this, when he remembers how his son began pining after her during his apprenticeship. Probably explains why he detested Lion Blaze so much, too. During one of the aforementioned search parties in the tunnels, Heathertail wanders off by herself like an idiot, and, big surprise, gets attacked by the stoats. Breeze Pelt, the reckless, emotional cat he is, ain't having any of that shit and quite literally throws himself into the nest after her, rescuing her from a horrible fate. Heathertail, realizing she has a knight in shining armor at her beck and call, falls head over heels right then and there. Crowfeather approves of the match, but can't help but scoff at the she-cat's moony-eyed stare, in a moment very reminiscent of Jayfeather's sarcastic retorts against Barry Nose and Poppy Frost in The Fourth Apprentice. This is a nice touch, it really highlights the similarities between Crowfeather and his ThunderClan son. It's details like this that makes the moments in which Crowfeather ponders over his contributions to his own family tree feel genuine. Oh wait, what was this segment about? Oh right! For once, this book doesn't carry a large chunk of romance in it, instead leaving it in the background and allowing the main storyline to take focus. It's really refreshing after so many failed attempts at romance subplots in these books. And even as a background event, the Breeze Pelt and Heathertail liaison still has more development than a main character ship. Let's say Lion Blaze and Cinderheart, for example. The latter spends one romantic night together in Fading Echoes, ignore each other for the rest of the book, then jump right into it again in Night Whispers, start fantasizing about kids on day three, and break up the moment Lion Blaze tries to talk to her about a serious issue, then get back together after a two-minute talk in The Last Hope. It's laughable just how shallow this love story is. Compare that to Breeze Pelt in Heathertail. Breeze Pelt is always looking out for her. Heathertail is vigilant in supporting him against his clanmate's cruelty and they are seen in each other's company almost all the time. Lionblaze, Cinderheart, your asses got beat by a supporting wannabe villain and a glorified background character. Get your shit together! Alright, last thing to talk about. The ending. Since this book takes place between Omen of the Stars and A Vision of Shadows, we know Windcline is eventually going to, to defeat the Stoats. But how? Well, after convincing ThunderClan to help them, they hatch a plan to lure the stoats out of the tunnels to fight them on open ground. Breezepel volunteers to be the lure, and fights valiantly in the ensuing battle. It all comes full circle when Lionblaze is pinned down by the animals, and Breezepel saves his life, finally earning his half-brother's forgiveness. But it nearly costs him everything to do so. He's gravely injured in the fight, and his wounds eventually become infected. Kestrel Flight informs Crowfeather that he doesn't have any burdock root left to treat him, and without it, Breeze Pelt will die. Crowfeather is thrust into the terrible position of begging his other ThunderClan son for help. I love how intense this scene is. Jayfeather is still furious with his father in Breeze Pelt, and rightfully so. Breezepel tried to kill his brother and insulted the memory of his sister. But even more than that, he also tried to kill Jayfeather. But the medicine cat doesn't mention that, and if there was a good time as any to bring that up, it would be here, when he's unloading all of that pent-up resentment and anger. But he didn't. You know why? Because he doesn't consider that important, not like the wrongdoings against his siblings. It's in this moment that Crowfeather realizes just how much his sons take after him. He sees the worst of himself and Breezepelt reflected in Jayfeather's fury. And it's this same fury that reveals all three characters' tragic deaths. 
Think about each of these characters at their lowest point. Crowfeather when he rejected his ThunderClan litter and Leafpool during the gathering in Sunrise, Breezepelt attacking Lionblades in The Last Hope, and Jayfeather's misery over his blindness during the site. At these times, all three Toms were extremely hostile towards others in order to cover up their emotional turmoil. I am confident in this analysis because of a conversation slightly earlier in the book, right before the final battle. Crowfeather talks to his son after the gathering, when cats from both WindClan and ThunderClan once again accuse him of being a traitor. Breezepelt confides in him that the reason he joined the Dark Forest was because he wanted someone to believe in him, and couldn't get that support from his clan. This leads Crowfeather to realize that Breezepelt's attempted murder on Lionblaze was driven not by hatred and maliciousness, but a sense of failure and isolation. Yet, it's this same theory that also reveals one of the best traits shared by this trio. Selflessness. As I mentioned before, Jayfeather's rant shows his priorities are with his loved ones, not himself. Breezepelt proves that his priorities are in the same place, when he tosses himself into mortal danger to save Heathertail, and attempts to sneak out of camp multiple times to avenge Nightcloud, a would-be rampage with suicidal odds. Crowfeather is sort of a dark mirror toward his sons when it comes to this trait, because while he does spend a lot of time worrying and grieving for his lovers, as shown in the prologue, his agony is also mixed with his own misery and self-pity. It's a classic theme in stories, of a child who proves themselves as the better version of their parent. Because that's what most parents want to see, their own potential, realized to greater heights in their children. Despite this epiphany, Crowfeather can't make amends with Breezepelt as easily as Jayfeather. But the medicine cat can't bring himself to allow another cat to die when he knows he can prevent it. So he gives Crowfeather the root anyway. Good on you, Jayfeather. You've proven yourself better than your adversary. So we all know the drill from here. Breezepelt gets the treatment he needs and makes a full recovery. Crowfeather finally manages to make amends with all of his estranged loved ones so Ashfoot can finally rest in peace knowing she has helped her son open his heart, learn to live again, and they all live happily ever after. Well, until this thing comes along anyway. All in all, this book was a pleasant surprise, a great way to distract myself with the horrors of a new school year. In a series that primarily follows young protagonists searching for their place in life and defending what they love, Crowfeather's Trial is a fresh take on the old warrior's tropes, following a seasoned protagonist and discovering what he loves. At its core, it's a story of a father trying to make up for his mistakes, while at the same time learning how to forgive and come to terms with harsh reality. Crowfeather also laminates on its ThunderClan sons in this book, but this subplot ends on a bittersweet note. First, with him realizing that he can never have an amicable relationship with Lionblaze, and second, with Jayfeather, continuing to hold a grudge against him for his actions. This is a surprisingly nice tang of reality to go on top of this mature storyline. It really reflects the fact that some things just can't be fixed. Crowfeather's Trial is truly a book that all ages can enjoy, and has something meaningful to say to everyone in this audience to the troubled outcasts struggling to prove themselves to society, to the unappreciated mother feeling insecure about her place in her family, to the father learning how to remove rust from an iron heart. We need more books like this in this series, character-centered stories that provide much needed depth and development to the cast. I never thought I would ever grow to care about Crowfeather, Breezepelt, or Nightcloud. But this super edition defied all odds and made all three of them likable. The final verdict for Crowfeather's trial is an 8 out of 10, and it would have gotten a 9 out of 10 if it wasn't for the fact that the majority of the plot relies on one star being a selfish, nearsighted, racist old dirtbag with no common sense. He has the gall to slobber all over Bramblestar's honor by accusing him of conspiring with Tigerstar in the final battle. An insult that makes no fucking sense. 
then hatches a plan to plug up the stoat holes on their side of the territory, leaving them no way to get out except for the tunnels on ThunderClan's side. One Star is fully aware of this problem, but he doesn't care. He goes through with it anyway just to spite them. And just when I thought he couldn't get to be more of a hateful asshole after Shattered Sky, he finds a way to top himself. In a book that takes place before Shattered Sky. And then he can't even do that right. He just calls it off when it gets dark, leaving some of the holes unblocked and rendering the entire plan pointless resulting in the camp getting attacked and over half of the clan sustaining serious injuries. Honestly, how has Wind Clan managed to stay together with this buffoon in charge? One Star spends the whole book defending Breeze Pelt's actions simply because he attacked a Thunder Clan cat, not a Wind Clan cat. But when Breeze Pelt stands up to his stupid decisions, he pulls a complete 180 and accuses him of being a traitor. Just, I can't get over how awful this guy is. I don't know what Tallstar was smoking when he thought One Star would make a good leader, but it must have been something out of Greek legend. Clearly, no mortal being was ever meant to consume it and live. That's how he really died. Smoking the legendary crack that melts brain cells. Just think about that, Tall Star. All the good you did, every single decision that paved the way to you becoming one of the great leaders of your clan's history, that legacy, it is tainted by every bad call One Star ever made. All of that bullshit he puts Wind Clan through is on your shoulders. Just let that sink in. One Star, you should be fucking ashamed of yourself. You should have died a long time ago. Losing a life in this book, then dying in Shattered Sky, that wasn't nearly fast enough. You shouldn't have been allowed within 10 miles of the moon pool. Hell, I wouldn't leave you in charge of organizing a picnic, let alone an entire nation state. Your prejudiced way of thinking is so outdated, fucking Tiger Star is telling you to get with the program. If I had a gun with three bullets and was locked in a room with Armitage Hux, Frieza from Dragon Ball Z, and you, I'd shoot you three times. You've got the pea-sized brain of Trump, the backstabbing tendencies of Clinton, and the shit-eating grin of every two-faced politician on the face of this planet. You fly off the handle faster than an SJW, and you're about as well-spoken as one, too. Wind Clan would be better off if they made their decisions by tossing your bloated corpse over a hill and waiting to see if you landed on your back or your belly. The only contribution you made to your society is producing kits. And even then, one of them nearly destroyed it. Plants wilt in your presence. A dark cloud of anxiety floats around everyone around you, just from you being there. You are nothing but a blight to the clans, a shameful taint on their way of life. You miserable, gutless, yellow-bellied, spineless, good-for-nothing, terrible, spiteful, heartless, dishonorable, hypocritical, pathetic, sniveling husk of a warrior. So eat that with a rotten zucchini, you corny sack of shit! What? You thought this would be a video without any rants? Pfft, get real.